And I've heard more than enough police chiefs admit that their officers are asked to do everything. And it's unfair to the officers. And the rank and file affirm that. So it's not rocket science to say we ought to go back to the drawing board and look at precisely what is the right balance between police service and public safety. Everybody talks about 18,000 police departments. I'll guarantee you we don't have 18,000 good police chiefs and sheriffs. That's just a fact. And so good policing and good leadership is more by, by chance than by design because we don't do enough to develop that next generation of police leaders. Thank you, everybody, for being with us for our second conversation of our action series as part of our Truth, Action, and Reconciliation conversations. Last week, we discussed the need for audacious leadership to create change. This week, we're going to talk about criminal justice reform and what is currently happening or unfortunately not happening on this issue. Also, unfortunately, Bakari Sellers, who was going to be with us today, couldn't join us because he got called away, but he will be back for our conversations on reconciliation. Our panel today is going to be led by Alana Odoms. She's a leading civil rights attorney and former deputy counsel of the Louisiana Supreme Court. She is the first African-American woman to be named the executive director of the ACLU of Louisiana. Joining her is going to be Nicole Porter, the director of Ad advocacy for the sentencing project and uh, local advocacy around sentencing reform and ending racial discrimination in the criminal justice system. Alex Karakatsanis, founder of the Civil Rights Corps and the 2019 Emerson Collective Dial Fellow, will round out our panel. So thank all of you for being with us. Welcome, everyone. And now, Alana, to you. Thank you, Mitch. And thank you for this lovely uh, opportunity to join you uh, and the team at E Pluribus Unum for this conversation. Also, thank you to our panelists, Nicole and Alec. Uh, we really have an incredible uh, set of, of minds and leaders here to help us unpack some really important issues. And I'll just take a moment to say that this is such a critical moment in our nation's history. So many are mourning, in particular members of the black and brown community. Uh, folks are reeling around uh, recent uh, decisions by law enforcement to not prosecute uh, the killers of Breonna Taylor. And I just wanna take a moment to recognize that this is an incredibly difficult time uh, for so many. Um, I also want to just raise a point about uh, this action series. So uh, a colleague of mine told me something pretty powerful about the relationship between hope and action. Many of us think that hope is what inspires action. So we must first be hopeful and that will inspire us to take action. But in fact, uh, it's actually the opposite. We must first take action and that is what will inspire us to be hopeful. And so to help us take those actions today and understand that the actions that need to be taken, we're going to be talking with uh, leaders, Alec and Nicole. I wanna first start out by talking about race and in our criminal legal system and the myths that uh, abound in terms of the way that our system is really defined uh, by race and the outcomes that the system produces. So this will be to both panelists. Public opinion about race and crime is shaped significantly by myth rather than by fact. What do you believe are some examples of public notions of criminality that are linked to anti-Black racism and racial bias? I'll kick it to Nicole first. Thank you, Alana, and thank you all for having me on the panel this afternoon. There's a couple of contributing factors that reinforce myths. One is media perceptions and how they reinforce perceptions of crime. So since the early 80s, American residents overall have had a higher chance of coming in contact with the police. Once American residents have that high contact of coming in contact with the police, they have a higher chance of being charged with a crime, a higher chance of going to prison. And once, going, once they go to prison, a higher chance of serving time in prison for a longer period of time than they did in previous eras. Now that high contact with the police is most acutely felt in communities of color located in cities. And because of the disproportionate representation of residents in those communities who come in contact with the police and then the subsequent coverage of that police contact on local media um, outlets, that reinforces perceptions of crime, even though overall, particularly when it comes to drug crime, drug use, 
and drug reports of uh, contact with um, substance abuse are equitable between African American residents and white residents, but it's the enforcement of certain offenses that reinforces notions and myths around disproportionate causes of crime um, by communities of color and black and brown residents in particular. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing that. And that makes me think about an ACLU report that recently came out that showed that uh, marijuana usage among uh, African-American and uh, their white counterparts is exactly equal, but that in the state of Louisiana, marijuana prosecution is three times as much for the African-American community. And so we obviously see that those, uh, the racial disparity there and driving the, the idea that uh, Black people are more uh, likely to be substance users. Alec, join in here. I actually think that's a perfect example for what I want to talk about, you know, just by way of, of corroboration. Uh, in Washington, D.C., where I live, uh, Black and white people use marijuana in similar rates. White people actually use and sell it in, in, in larger rates over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, and consistently, um, over 90 to 95 percent of all police arrests for marijuana have been of Black people in D.C. Um, and Black people are less than half the population. Um, that is the case in every single jurisdiction in which the issue has been studied. And the the, that's an incredible fact when you think about um, also that this is a country that puts Black people in cages at a rate six times that of South Africa at the height of apartheid. Um, so I wanted to talk about, I think there's really, in my mind, three different stages at which um, the, the, the sort of racial um, prejudice and, and sort of history of, of racial discrimination comes into play in terms of notions of criminality and crime. The first is what does our society even consider a crime? Um, so, you know, um, throughout this country's history, uh, we've decided to make certain substances criminal and certain substances not criminal. And it, at each time of the criminalization of a particular substance, whether it was, was opioids with respect to, to um, perceived use by Chinese immigrants, um, uh, whether it was uh, the marijuana plant, um, associated heavily with perceived use by Mexican American immigrants, uh, cocaine, um, which was heavily criminalized as a way of criminalizing and, and de disenfranchising Black people, particularly in the American South, um, and, and then not just drugs, though. Um, and, oh, and by the way, and 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 um, not criminalizing tobacco, for example, which is a huge source of white uh, wealth in this country. Um, even though tobacco kills 450,000 Americans every single year, including 45,000 from secondhand smoke alone, those are non-smokers, 15 times the number of people killed by September 11th. Um, so society is making very particular political choices about what's called a crime. Um, so is it a crime, for example, to join a union, which it was in, in, in some parts of this country's history in certain places? Is it a crime to stop people from joining a union? Those are two very different political choices. My point is that what is a crime is just a political choice. And when you understand that, you can understand how the people who had power in our society, whether it was white Southern landowners in the, re the post-Reconstruction era, making it a crime to not have a job um, um, and then arresting Black people for, the, for, the, for that offense, um, whether it's a crime like it was when I went to Ferguson in many of the municipalities around Ferguson, it's a crime to sag your pants too low, okay? It was a crime to um, have an overnight guest in your house without getting a permit from the, from the city. Um, so what is a crime? In many places around the country, most places, it's a crime for poor people to wager in the streets over dice. But it's not a crime for wealthy people to wager over international currencies or the global supply of wheat, even though speculation over the, the price of wheat and gambling over it really has led to mass famine and starvation around the world. I could go on and on. But I think that the key point is the first decision of what's the crime is heavily racialized. The second decision that's very important is among the things that we've chosen to make crimes, like let's say drug possession, um, we, we only enforce that crime against certain people, sometimes, some places, right? So um, where I went to college and law school were two very fancy universities. Um, there were never any police raids of the students in those schools, even though they were uh, rampant underage drinking, lots of drug use, um, lots of drug selling, um, including many other uh, very serious uh, crimes are being committed. Um, 
when you think of the lack of enforcement of sexual assault laws on university campuses, for example. Um, but those same um, offenses were being enforced ruthlessly with search warrants like the one that killed Breonna Taylor uh, in right down the street in majority black communities in the same towns where all those uh, privileged college students were going to school. And so police every single day, in every single city, they make intentional choices about what neighborhoods to patrol, what people to search and stop and frisk and arrest. And as we've seen in every study again that's ever been done in every single state that they've done it, black people are more likely to be pulled over by the police, but actually less likely than white people to have contraband when they're pulled over. Um, so these are intentional decisions that people are making about which laws to enforce against which people. Another example that I love uh, is that um, it's a crime to steal someone's wages. We call it wage theft. Um, wage theft um, is a huge problem around the country. Uh, conservative estimates are that it's between 50 and $100 billion stolen from low-wage workers every single year. It's about 10 times the total amount, all theft, robbery, and burglary, and shoplifting combined of all other crimes. No one is ever prosecuted as an employer and a corporation for wage theft. It's a choice that prosecutors are making. Where are we going to look for crimes? Who are we going to prosecute? And the final point that I think really um, uh, ties into this is something that Nicole just said. Um, once people make it into the legal system, there's an extraordinarily um, uh, disparate uh, effect of virtually every single aspect of the legal system. Are you going to get bail? Are you going to get released prior to trial? Um, uh, are you going to get offered a certain kind of plea or not? How long is your sentence going to be? Um, all of those things are also sort of every single turn associated uh, with racial disparities and, and discrimination. And so I think each of those stages um, serves a, a really important role in the overall outcome of a criminal legal system that uh, is really in, is pervaded uh, by racial animus and, and discrimination. Thanks for laying that out for us, Alex. So well put. Um, also, uh, something that comes to mind is a, a case that was recently in the news in Louisiana of a man named uh, Fair Wayne Bryant who received a life sentence for having stolen a pair of hedge clippers. And the reason that happened because was because of uh, Louisiana's incredibly punitive habitual offender law. Uh, and so we see, of course, uh, there are folks who identify as white who have committed crimes that are far more serious than that, who are not serving life in prison. Uh, and we have folks uh, like Mr. Bryant who uh, have served already in our system 20 years and uh, essentially have clearly paid their debt to society. And so disproportionate sentencing and punitive, highly punitive sentencing is something that is, of course, uh, very much so in line with Nicole's work. So I want to kick it to her here and ask her to just, would you just tell us about your work and how you believe it will lead to innovative and long-term change. Hi, everybody. Am I being, you, can you see me? We see you very well. Everything's okay, great. So apologies yes. for that, having technical difficulties a little bit. And I'm so sorry, could you repeat the question, Alana? That's okay, Nicole, we're just telling you, tell us a little bit about your work and how you think it will lead to systemic change. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the Sentencing Project is a bridge organization uh, between the academy and the activists. We work in many ways to track trends of incarceration over time and have been doing that since the mid eighties. As an advocacy uh, professional with the Sentencing Project, I work specifically with state and local advocates to make use of our research findings and apply them in issue campaign efforts. And we've had some success over that over time, but clearly there's still a substantial number of people who've been disappeared behind prison and jail. Every year, there's active efforts to try to reform criminal legal practices through state legislatures and also locally trying to address, you know, specific changes that can be implemented through district attorney's offices and through police departments. Clearly, in spite of any intermediate wins, there's deep structural issues that need to be addressed. And there continues to be harm that are experienced by the communities as is evidenced by the outcome in Breonna Taylor's case and the recent unrest and uprisings that are taking place, not just in Kentucky, but all over the country and world, as a matter of fact. So, but I think given the structural barriers that we're up against when it comes to the criminal justice system and other areas of social policy in the United States, that it is through stories of short-term success that can be aligned with ongoing struggles for structural reform and justice that can give people um, 
those wins in the in the short term and also build resistance and support resilience within communities. So I think in spite of the recent outcome in Breonna Taylor's case and other issues that have you know, reminded us of the structural challenges and the white supremacist policies that you know, orient much of the United States practices through the criminal legal system and other areas of social policy. There are wins. There's active efforts right now to close prisons in California. There's also effort to, efforts to repurpose a prison in Georgia, in Atlanta specifically, a closed jail in Atlanta. And there are similar conversations happening throughout the South, particularly in Texas. But that also bumps up against an effort to expand prison. So in Alabama, a state that suffered chronic prison overcrowding and where there's been horrendous reports this year. In fact, the year started off with horrendous reports coming out of Alabama and Mississippi on the conditions of those prison systems. And in Alabama, rather than work to decarcerate and reduce the number of people inside who no longer pose a risk to public safety, and who've been who served too long prison sentences in that state, there's efforts to expand the state prison system rather than decarcerate it. So there are ongoing struggles in spite of any successes that have happened over the last couple of years, there's still a substantial number of people in prison and jail. And yet it's immediate opportunities and immediate stories of resilience and efforts to challenge structural systems that help to build this movement and help to build momentum um, towards change and hopefully can get us to a point where we do see justice, where we can achieve true justice in our lifetimes. And if not in our lifetimes, at least contribute to it going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so absolutely. And I, I think, you know, we at the ACLU have uh, especially been kind of sounding the alarm around uh, prison and jail overcrowding, especially in light of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we've simply just heightened the calls for decarceration and sadly, of course, have encountered many um, barriers to helping people be released. Uh, there was an effort uh, to convene a medical furlough panel in the state of Louisiana and uh, some 1200 uh, individuals were to be considered. And importantly, these were folks who were within six months of their release or would have been otherwise, and had committed low-level nonviolent offenses, property and drug offenses. And of those 1,200 people who were to be considered for release, uh, they were medically vulnerable as well. Uh, only 2% of those individuals uh, were released. Uh, and the entire medical furlough panel process was completely clandestine. Uh, lawyers were not, participate, uh, were, able, were not able to participate. Advocacy groups were not able to participate. And so the ACLU uh, filed a public records request to obtain the do documentation from that medical furlough panel. And so we're in the process of reviewing some, some preliminary documents that have been turned over. But what we see, you know, is, is frankly just a system of, of, that lacks transparency. Uh, lacks credibility, and really is not based upon public safety in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and so I, you know, this is a great segue for us to talk about, I think, some of Alex's most hallmark work in terms of, of uh, the money bail system. When we talk about, we've been talking about race and the way that race shapes outcomes in our criminal justice system, or criminal legal system, rather. Um, but now let's talk about wealth and how wealth shapes those outcomes. Alec, tell us how things like challenging the money bail system and combating the criminalization of poverty provide sustainable solutions to the systems designed to oppress African-American people and people on the lower socioeconomic level. In order to understand the American money bail system, I think you have to understand some of the, the systems that sort of precede the money bail system, like the policing system, so I think the money bail system is really an outgrowth of the fact that we are trying to arrest and cage so many more people than any other society has ever tried to do. And so the system had to develop like an assembly line, uh, ways of doing, of processing those cases efficiently. Because we take about 11 million people every single year away from their children and their homes and their churches and their schools and their jobs and their families and their communities and we put them into this government-run process that has 
handcuffs and sirens and tasers and guns and cages and lawyers and probation officers and parole officers and judges. It's a giant bureaucracy. And that bureaucracy's goal, like with any bloated bureaucracy, is to try to be as efficient as possible um, in accomplishing um, this processing of whatever it is it's processing. And in this case, it's processing people's lives and their people. bodies. Mm -hmm. And so the money bail system, I think, really has made two major origins, at least the modern money bail system. One is an attempt to, to as quickly as possible, uh, determine who's going to be in jail and who's not going to be in jail. And the easiest way to do that is just assign some amount of money. If you can pay it, you're out of jail with your kids and your family and your job. If you can't pay it, you're stuck in a cage. Um, you don't need to have a long hearing. You don't need to have evidence and witnesses. You don't need to do any kind, anything rigorous. You just sort of, do you have the money or not? And that's how the system processes so many millions of arrests. The second origin of the modern American money bail system is the for-profit commercial bail industry. This country is one of only two countries, the United States and the Philippines, that allows for a for-profit industry like the commercial money bail industry. And what we, what, if you look back sort of about a thousand years since before the Magna Carta, um, what bail always meant was a condition of release that was typically unsecured, meaning you don't need to pay before you get out of jail. You just promise to pay if you don't show up in court. Um, Around uh, the late 19th century, we saw the first for-profit money bail company start. And then since mass incarceration in the last few decades, it has exploded. And judges and courts and cities are now increasingly using secured money bail, uh, which means you have to pay up front to get out of jail. And a lot of that is because these for-profit companies wrote the laws in many states and they donate to a lot of the judicial campaigns of these judges. And they've really entrenched this idea that in order to get out of jail, you should have to pay some amount of money. What's so fascinating about that is there's absolutely no evidence that this does anyone any good except for the companies that are making money off of it. In fact, the overwhelming evidence that we've seen all over the country by every academic uh, article that's been studying it and in the federal court cases that we've been bringing throughout uh, Texas and Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, California, Illinois, um, the, the central thing that we're learning is that if you keep someone in jail, even for 48 or 72 hours after their arrest, you actually make that person more likely to commit crime in the future. You destabilize their life. Um, they, they get off their medication. They, they can't get mental health treatment. They miss their job. And so they get fired from their job. Um, and now all of a sudden they're in this cycle of poverty and unemployment. Um, How many people they, do you know can miss their job for three days and still have it when they go back to it, right? That's right. That's exactly right. And so um, the money bill system simply reinforces the cycle of poverty that led to the person getting arrested in the first place. So what we've been doing all over the country is asking a very simple question. Um, does, this, does the government have a really fundamentally good reason for putting this human being in a cage away from her family? And if they don't, the person should be released, regardless of whether they're rich or they're poor. And, and that really, in a nutshell, um, is one of the biggest critiques that we have about the criminal system generally. Virtually no aspect of the American criminal system is done because it's good policy. Um, it's not evidence to support it. There's no evidence to support long sentences doing anyone any good, for example, um, like Nicole was talking about. There's no evidence to support the money bail system. These are systems that a bureaucracy developed for very different reasons put as many people in jail as quickly as possible and to coerce them to plead guilty because one thing that every judge and every prosecutor understands, we couldn't possibly have 11 million jury trials every year for every person the police arrested. The people who wrote the constitution and wrote in their right to a jury trial, they didn't intend on mass incarceration. And so the system had to come up with ways of coercing people to pleading guilty. And the best way to coerce someone to plead guilty is you keep them in a jail cell prior to trial and you say, you're free to go home as soon as you want. You just have to plead guilty and then you're gonna owe us some fees and fines. Wow, so powerfully put. I'll share a, a report that the ACLU did called Justice Can't Wait, which looked at uh, pretrial detention in the state of Louisiana. And it showed that on any given day, there are 15,000 Louisianians behind bars in cages in jail. Uh, at a cost to taxpayers of almost $300 million. 
and nearly 57% of those, uh, those people who are incarcerated are there for low level nonviolent offenses, things like property crime and drug crime. And so um, we also see that in certain locations, uh, the racial disparities are incredible. Uh, something like 19 times as likely uh, folks, African-American people to be incarcerated pre-trial before they've even been charged or before they have a trial in New Orleans, if you would believe that. And we're also seeing folks, uh, Black folks spending twice as long uh, in, in prison. And so this is, I'm sorry, in jail. So this is something that is incredibly mind boggling and doesn't make sense ethically, morally, uh, doesn't make sense economically. Uh, but as you said, Alex, really is about justifying uh, a system that is, is pretty much economical in terms of the, the industry that it's created, right? We've, we've got to provide jobs for uh, all of the actors in the system that are keeping the system operating. Uh, Nicole, I want to talk to you uh, about this problem of mass incarceration and, and talk about sentencing. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world, uh, in the United States. And as you know, many Southern states are leading the, the nation in per, per capita incarceration. Obviously, Louisiana, once again, sadly being at the top of that list, not just for uh, per capita post-conviction incarceration, but also for pretrial incarceration. Nicole, where do we start on this? What do you believe are the first steps to long lasting change that will help us move from a retributive system to a system of rehabilitation? Great question, Alana, thank you for it. So I think the information that Alec has shared so far around criminalization and pretrial bail is one aspect of challenging mass incarceration. I think when it comes to sentencing, creating space even to look at violent offenses is also going to help us challenge mass incarceration and substantially reduce the number of people in prison. And you know this from Louisiana, given the high rate of people sentenced to life prison terms in Louisiana and how that's grown over time. In fact, since 1970, the number of people sentenced to life prison terms in Louisiana has grown as 268% larger than the actual number of people who were in prison in 1970. So as of 2016, over 11,000 people in Louisiana were serving life prison terms, whereas in 1970, just a little bit over 4,700 individuals were in Louisiana prisons overall. That all, that's also true nationally, where the total number of people sentenced to life prison terms today, that's 206 individuals or one out of every seven persons in U.S. prisons, is greater than the total number of people in prison at the state and federal level in 1970. So in order to challenge mass incarceration, to meaningfully challenge it, we do have to be looking at mass criminalization and what the war, what the war on drugs has contributed to the growth in the prison population. But we also have to look at responses to violent crime and understand what the research tells us and what the evidence tells us. And that is that generally most people age out of crime. And even if someone committed a very serious offense, a homicide, a robbery, an assaultive offense, that those offenses are generally situational. Mostly they're committed by young adults, people who may be younger than age 18. And there's been a lot of revisiting of life prison terms for youth over the years. There's also a growing network of organizers and others, practitioners who are looking at young adults, people who may have been 18 or older up to age 30 and are building the case and are building uh, options, including expanding rehabilitation for young adults who may have committed serious offenses. So one of the key takeaways of this, of what I wanna share with the audience this afternoon is that in order to meaningfully challenge mass imprisonment, we also have to be looking at responses to violence and how our responses are extreme because they offer the possibility of life without parole in addition to the extreme sentence of the death penalty in the United States. And so to address that, the Sentencing Project actually launched a campaign about a year and a half ago, a national campaign to end life imprisonment and people can find information about that at endlifeimprisonment.org and we're working nationally and within states to help challenge life imprisonment and create options even for people committed, uh, sentenced to the most serious offenses. 
That's really exciting. And honestly, we need uh, so much of the research that you just provided in the state of Louisiana, but we need it all across this country. Uh, and particularly in the South, um, because we really do need to make decisions about uh, legislative reform, judicial reform based on evidence. And I was so um, glad to hear you speak about the evidence uh, around aging out of crime and how you know most folks, when they're committing offenses, if they are um, deemed to be violent offenses, th those crimes are often happening around you know the late teenage um, to early 20s. And that folks are really not committing those kinds of offenses beyond the age of their mid-30s and later. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting, I spent some time um, learning about criminological research when we conducted the Justice Reinvestment Task Force back in 2017 and really learned about the uh, idea that these lengthier sentences 20, 30, 40, 50 years in prison, uh, they're actually completely um, adverse to people doing well long term, obviously, because we're starting to create a geriatric system where we're just keeping people until they're very elderly. Um, we are um, essentially ignoring all the research around the aging out that you just spoke about. And we're also ignoring the fact that lengthier sentences uh, actually increase recidivism. And there's so much around that research that really is counterintuitive. Um, and it feels like, you know, if we were just to ask the average layperson what they might think about a lengthy sentence, would a lengthier sentence be better, especially for a more serious offense, they'd likely say yes. But if they had the opportunity to sit with this research, they would really see. And, and, and a lot of uh, the criminal legal uh, practice that happens outside the United States is based on this research, which is why in, in countries in the uh, UK, uh, Germany, you see folks are not, even for the most serious of offenses, are not spending more than 20 years in prison because it doesn't make sense. It's, it doesn't help create a, a system of rehabilitation. It, it bogs down the system. It's incredibly expensive. And so they're really kind of using this to, to guide their decision making. So I'm so grateful that you shared that research with us. And I would encourage everyone on this line to, to check out the research of the Sentencing Project. They've taught me so much. And I think their uh, research could be incredibly helpful, especially to lawmakers, judges, prosecutors, people who have the decision-making power on how long to sentence people and the kinds of uh, sentences to seek. Um, I wanna ask this to the larger group. We've kind of dug in on some nuts and bolts. I wanna take us back up, you know, maybe to the aerial 30,000 foot level and talk about some foundational values. Alec, what do you believe are some of the foundational values that should be instituted at all levels of our justice system in order to address some of these systemic racist, uh, systemic barriers that continue to exist today? That's such a difficult question because I don't think that we've ever really had a legal system that could in any way be deserving of the term justice system. The purpose of the criminal legal system in this country for the first 200 years of its existence was in many respects to um, preserve various forms of white supremacy. First, um, the ownership of, of black human beings, um, the uh, theft of land from native indigenous uh, human beings, um, the um, prevention of organizing by workers, um, these were some of the main functions of the criminal legal system. And in fact, um, when, you, when you look at the rise of the modern police force, the two circumstances which really gave rise to most modern police forces were um, slave patrols um, and um, urban uh, uh, collections of armed officers to, to bust union worker direct action strikes and other um, campaigns. So, um, it's hard to, 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 to talk about the justice system um, in any way other than as a historical uh, stain on really all of the values that I think we share. Um, values like um, uh, all human beings deserve uh, an opportunity to uh, live a flourishing life. And for much of this country's history, the legal system was used in exactly the opposite way to control and exploit and punish and surveil and entrap people in cycles of debt and poverty in a way that, that made them and their families completely unable to live a flourishing life. And that cemented um, distributions of, of white wealth ownership in this society as, as really the foundational 
form of, of, of wealth generation. Um, so in terms of like, where do we go from here? I think we need to completely cast aside many of the foundational assumptions that we all grew up with with respect to the criminal punishment system and ask ourselves um, what, kind of, of, what kinds of relationships and what kinds of cultural uh, norms um, would a truly healthy society try to cultivate to prevent human beings from harming other people? Because our society causes a lot of harm and trauma, whether it's environmental pollution, um, you know, air pollution and water pollution kill more people than violent crime um, in this country every single year. Um, the, whether it's uh, when someone hurts someone else, we should be asking the question, um, how did that trauma occur? How did that person get to the point where they, where they hurt someone else? Um, that is gonna mean really tough things like analyzing deprivation and poverty and, and, and lack of access to, to jobs and mental health care and treatment for drug addiction. It's gonna mean confronting things like toxic masculinity, which is really at the core of a lot of our society's gender-based violence. It doesn't do anyone any good to throw someone in a cage who is engaged in an act of, of gender-based violence. It doesn't do the person who was harmed any good. It doesn't do the, the person who harmed that person any good to be thrown in a cage uh, for 30 or 45 days and to be thrust back out into the same community without ever having even been held really accountable for what they did. So I think in terms of where do we go from here and what values should really underlie the system, I think you know number one, it should be how do we create a society with all kinds of institutions um, that promote human flourishing. And that means not relying on the criminal punishment system to solve the problems that we're creating with every other area of law. Um, the criminal punishment system right now is the biggest place that we're dealing with mental illness in this country. Um, that's ridiculous, right? We should have a, a, a set of values that says, how can we take care of people and prevent mental illness and then treat it when it occurs? Not how can we punish people for some of the actions they might engage in after they're mentally ill. Um, that's just one minor example, but I think it's going to require fundamentally shifting from a punishment mentality to a proactive prevention and care mentality. I think that's going to be a lot, uh, very difficult for people because of the systemic propaganda that they've been exposed to for many years that punishment somehow is, is deserved by people who harm people or punishment somehow is going to lead us all to a better world, which we all know that it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah thinking about care, compassion, and concern as opposed to punishment. That is going to be uh, something that is fundamentally different than where we are today. Nicole, can you shed some light on some foundational values that you think we need to embrace? Sure. And I think just like many advocates and followers of history are moved by expansions of democracy, people can also be moved by ways to expand justice or ways to respond um, to crime and, and uh, people who might uh, be lawbreakers. And there's one specific example from history. So in the 1960s and 70s, violent crime did increase in the United States and that was used as a pretext to expand the prison system. But violent crime also increased in Finland and Germany and those nations did not respond in the way that the United States did by growing prison cells and sending more and more people to prison. Those uh, countries responded to an increase in violent crime by expanding social policies with a focus on prevention and rehabilitation. So responding to crime does not equal, does not necessarily equal sending more people to prison. There could be other responses, there could be other choices. And in fact, we know that the growth of imprisonment in the United States is a function of policy um, in politics, not just practice. So, and I think given the conversation this afternoon and given how this conversation is going to be contributing to an overall move towards transformation and reconciliation, there's work to be done over the last 30 to 40 years to intentionally decarcerate and address the policies and practices that have contributed to the substantial prison growth nationally and within Louisiana and across the South and other states like Mississippi and Alabama. And once those efforts are met, there's work to repair the harm done. And there's intentional ways to go about doing that. That can be done through state legislatures, through repealing the practices that have contributed to prison growth, like mandatory minimum sentences, 
truth and sentencing provisions and a range of other statutory requirements that require time served that have lengthened over time and have contributed to the growth in prison. And once those reforms are experienced and put in place, repairing the harm by prioritizing resources towards social policy outside of the criminal justice system and towards prevention, like expanding access to early childhood education and healthcare to not just include physical health, but also therapeutic health with the goal of meeting the needs of justice involved residents. You all have done this in Louisiana through some of the justice reinvestment work. There's other efforts towards reparative justice throughout the South, including in states like Mississippi and South Carolina. And I think that those current experiences and the lessons that they're teaching us today can help inform potential strategies going forward and to let people know that there are practical ways to put in place efforts to repair the harm, reconcile how policies have gotten the United States and particularly the South to be the highest incarcerator in the world and that as we work to expand responses to justice, just like we've expanded democracy over time, we can find a pathway towards reconciliation. And there are people actively engaging in that work and doing that work today. Yeah, it sounds to me like you're talking a lot about a restorative justice model, really helping people understand educating uh, folks who have been harmed and also folks who have committed harm on ways to actually make um, victims whole. And I think, frankly, this system has sold us a bill of goods about uh, retribution that if your assailant is incarcerated, that you will have peace or that you will uh, be healed and you will have closure. And as folks who, who have been victims of, of, of crime, whether it be violence or otherwise, know that whether or not someone is incarcerated may have some small um, uh, sentiment in terms of how you you think about the the situation, but in terms of your healing and what you need to do to take care of yourself, um, it it doesn't have very much to do with that at all. And so, really thinking about how can we help prioritize victim services, really, you know, recognizing that the people who are are committing harm are many times victims themselves at at, at the outset, which is why they are actually committing harm. So so thinking about uh, the defendant as as the person uh, who's also experienced harm um, is, is a very important thing to think about uh, as well. We've, we've gotten onto the topic of serious crimes and, and I think you know there's so many people who I think want to engage in this conversation around racist policing. And I do too, frankly, because it's something that we've been thinking a lot about at the ACLU. And we recognize that um, for far too long, our system has not held police accountable for violations of the constitutional rights of, of citizens. Um, these actions uh, have for long uh, gone, you know, uh, just completely unvindicated. And we believe we've got a program called the Justice Lab, where we're seeking to represent hundreds, if not thousands of people in the state of Louisiana who've experienced unconstitutional policing. And we believe, and sadly, what we're coming to see with the, the enormous number of cases of people that are coming forward is that people are victimized every single day. So we see, obviously, we've seen Trayvon Martin and Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Philando Castile and the names go on and on. We see that they've been, their lives have been taken. Many instances, the police not held accountable. And also that their, uh, the civil rights of the, the individual are, are also not vindicated. Alec, can you tell us what you think um, are some checks and balances that we could have further on this kind of unaccountability? I think it's a profoundly difficult question because the current system is is not designed to provide that at all. Um, and so we need to be thinking outside the box, outside of the current system for any hope of not just, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in accountability, but I'm also interested in making sure those harms don't happen at all in the first place. And that's where I think there's a little bit of a difference. What we've seen in, in the, the last um, two decades is that most major American police forces are very happy to pay out hundreds of millions of dollars in money damages that people when they violate their rights and sue them. Um, what they don't want to do is reduce the size of their policing bureaucracy or give up any of their power um, or give up their weapons 
um, their surveillance tools. And in fact, we've seen exactly the opposite, dramatic expansion in, um, of the military technologies that were developed for use on the battlefield elsewhere in the world have now fully infiltrated uh, US policing from tools that most ordinary people in this country have no idea the police are deploying against them, including capturing their cell phone data as they move around the, the city to infrared um, sensors and, and, and the ability to see into people's homes, um, to um, uh, license plate readers that track everyone's movement around cities to uh, what's called predictive policing, uh, which predicts when you or others might be involved in what the police can consider crime, to um, algorithms and, and data tracking um, software uh, powered by really sophisticated companies like Amazon and Palantir that can collect enormous amounts of data about you and predict who you're gonna be meeting with and who you're gonna be associating with and when and where and how. Um, that's just a tiny sliver of, of, of what is going on. And so what does it mean to hold a system like that accountable? I mean, I, I think that the, the, the much more important question um, is um, how do we prevent this system from getting so big and powerful? Because if it's this big and this powerful, it's never gonna be held accountable by a legal system. And so one of the things that I think um, is really exciting about the project you're doing in Louisiana and, and, and similar projects that we're working on around the country is the ability to um, um, tell ordinary people what the police have been doing with their money and in their name um, and having a conversation about wh why is it the case um, that uh, police in most major towns um, uh, have been increasing their budgets every single year, even as quote unquote crime, which I think is a socially constructed concept, um, which is relatively meaningless, has been going down and down and down. Um, if, if, if marijuana was the largest uh, source of your arrests and we legalize marijuana in your state, why is your police force budget going up? Um, simple questions like that. Why are you spending a significant uh, percentage of your police budget on militarized home raids and no knock warrants? And why are you spending a significant amount of your police budget on overtime? Um, so all of these questions, I mean, there's 100,000 more uh, questions one could ask, but these are the kinds of conversations that are, I think we're going to start having more and more of. Um, and I think what people will see, and, and I've been focusing a lot on, on Houston, for example, which has a $960 million local police budget. Um, and that doesn't even count the $560 million budget of the local sheriff's office and the 60 other police forces in addition to the Houston Police Department. So we're talking about one city that spends several billion dollars a year on punishment in cages and handcuffs. And when I recently debated the Houston police chief on a podcast about this, he said the reason they needed this was that we are currently now living in the most violent society in, in the modern world. Um, and I said to him, well, if, if the society right now is the most violent in the modern world and you've been spending hundreds of millions of dollars every single year on these strategies and it's still the most violent society, isn't it time to try something else? What if instead of giving you an extra 40 or $50 million so that you can have undercover officers entrap people into buying drugs and then caging them for another um, $100,000 a year each because they bought and sold a drug, what if we gave that money to local school systems and mental health treatment and poetry and theater and music programs for children and athletic programs. Like these are direct trade-offs between nurses and doctors and teachers and police officers. Mm -hmm. And there is not a shred of evidence that investing in police um, does anyone any good. So when I think about accountability, I think about it in a slightly different sense. How are all of us whose money the police are wasting and not only wasting, but using to brutalize people how are they accountable to us? Because there is not a single other entity or company or anyone in this country that would have a terrible record of violating the law, um, of discrimination and brutalizing you by separating people's families without any shred of evidence that they do anyone any good. And we'd still be giving them more and more money every year. That's not accountability at all. And so that's what I think about when I think about accountability, less so in the sense of like holding individual cops accountable for the bad things that they do every now and then. I'm interested in holding the entire system accountable for this extraordinary waste of all of our resources. That's one of the most compelling uh, explanations that I've heard for the 
um, defunding argument or the divestment reinvestment um, movement, uh, the way that the ACLU characterizes it. I've also heard it as reform and reallocation. Folks have a lot of difficulty sometimes, I think, with the language around defund because it feels very scary, or at least we're told to be afraid of it. But you know, it really sounds like what you're saying is, frankly, a budget is a moral document. And how we decide to allocate funding uh, to certain entities really reflects our value and the value that we have for human life. And if we continue to uh, overwhelmingly uh, invest in, in org organizations, districts that brutalize people and harm them and do not actually help to keep us safe, it's really quite unjustifiable. And why wouldn't we rather want to direct those funds to, to services that can actually help and affirm life? Um, I'm going to ask you this question, Nicole, and it's probably the million dollar question. So thankfully, I know you're incredibly brilliant and you're going to help us uh, to get to the bottom of it. Uh, one of our viewers asks, many Americans are experiencing a total lack of trust and hope in our country's future. What kind of sense of hope and encouragement can you extend during these times? And what specific actions can we take to support the work that you do? Well, and thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for the question. I appreciate the question from the audience viewer. You know, I'll just lean back on something I said earlier in our conversation this afternoon, and that is looking at stories of resilience and having that inform active ways that we can today be responding to the challenges of the time and moving us forward in response to in ways to honor the stories around Breonna Taylor's killing and the other names that you've mentioned uh, this afternoon, Alana, Trayvon, Ahmad, George. Uh, Sandra Bland as well. I mean, so many, right? And those are recent history in this, it calls to memory um, names from long past that have also informed periods of activism. Emmett Till, Reese Taylor, so many, so many. And, but it is the stories of, res of resilience that in response to individual acts of oppression that when looked at together, speak to the collective um, harm that structural policies and structural practices cause and reinforce time and time again that we can move forward and that we can figure out and imagine and create a world, a better world for all of us. And, you know, I don't want to speak in platitudes just to speak in platitudes because there are specific ways for people to look at history, to be motivated by current stories of resilience, and then to have that inform activism going forward. Some people approach that by addressing legislative change and looking for reforms that can practically be applied in the short term. And that might include, particularly when it comes to policing, not just active efforts around uh, police budgets, city budgets, and how they fund the police, but also sentencing reform that reduces why and how police can arrest people and stop people to help recalibrate um, how residents interact with law enforcement altogether. I mentioned earlier that since the early 80s, people have a higher chance of coming in contact with police. And once people come in contact with police, they have a higher chance of being arrested. And those are two specific factors that have contributed to prison growth. So going back and revisiting the policies that lead to arrest, that contribute to those higher uh, police contacts, will hopefully help reduce prison growth and help reduce justice involvement overall. Because it's not just about crime, it's also about our responses to it. So those are two examples that I hope are responsive to that question. I think there's other, there's other examples of resilience that are informing current activism. There have been some successes. And I think at the end of the day, given the structural challenges that these efforts are speaking to, it's about planting seeds and creating a platform and an ongoing conversation that can help build and create the world and the country that we want to be living in. Mm -hmm. Alec, would you like to share some thoughts here? I mean, I think just I'd like to just take it up to a to a higher level uh, again, and just you know remind people that um, every single conversation in the mainstream media about these issues is heavily propagandized. Uh, we have been living in a society that has caged. Um, unprecedented numbers of people for decades. And in order to accomplish that, um, 
they had to tell us a, a number of stories, all of which were wrong. Um, black people are dangerous. Um, punishment is the way you prevent people from hurting other people. Um, you know, why were we told all those stories? And, and who is in a position of power telling them? And, it, and unless we fundamentally change um, the interests that control both the media discourse around this, this, this topic and the, the powerful interests that control local policymaking on every single level, I'm talking about things like police unions and, and whatnot, um, the same kinds of narratives and conversations are just gonna reproduce themselves. And we're seeing it all over the country now. Um, with the way that that police and, and police affiliated uh, forces are, are, are trying to change the, the the narrative away from defunding the police and toward sort of like um, uh, violent uh, protests and um, the police only ever want to talk about a certain kind of violence right they don't want to talk about the structural violence of racism and poverty they want to talk about the structural violence that leads kids to drink lead poisoned water. Um, that's not the kind of violence they want to talk about, the kind of violence that leads this country to have a record number of people who don't have a home to go to right now, the kind of violence that leads people to die because they can't get adequate health care. Um, these are the issues that poor communities are, are confronting, and, and they're being re-traumatized and re-brutalized by a police force and a society that has bought into that police propaganda about a very narrow conception of violence. So all of us in these discussions, I think it's very important to highlight that um, the criminal punishment system um, is only dealing with a very small percentage of the things that cause harm in our society. And the elite people who have a lot of power, who are causing all kinds of harms in other ways, they isn't brought into this discussion about the criminal punishment system or holding them accountable. And that's the, you know, the major message I'd love to leave with today. It's, it's all of us need to, to figure out how are we going to get ourselves out of the mindset that built the greatest incarceration bureaucracy in modern world history. And it's gonna require some pretty different ways of thinking than we've been used to. I'm excited about being a part of this kind of conversation and, and many others and um, about, about how to change that discourse. And, and so um, it, it's, it's always a pleasure to be invited to, to you know, share some of these ideas. And I understand that some of what I'm saying might come across as a little bit radical, but you know, when you have such a big problem, you sometimes have to think about solutions in a more radical way. You most certainly do. And I want to say that each of you on this call have spoken truth to power and you've brought us and are continuing to bring us these radical ideas that we've got to grapple with as a society. And it's so important. So what I would recommend for a viewing audience is that if you're not um, affiliated with uh, the sentencing project, if you haven't shored up your relationship with Civil Rights Corps, if you're not a member of the ACLU, uh, of Louisiana or a member of the ACLU, you should become one because you don't have to do this alone. You are not responsible necessarily for learning every aspect of the criminal legal system, for understanding legislation, for understanding the research, but there are people, for very courageous people, who are working on these issues who can help, uh, help give you some guidance on them. And so I'm really grateful for our panelists. And I, I really want to say from the bottom of my heart that the work that E Pluribus Unum is doing is again also very radical. It's radical in that um, we are sharing information that is perhaps not commonly uh, agreed upon. But I think we should recognize that even folks like, for example, Martin Luther King, who's thought of as someone who is incredibly beloved and someone who everyone says, yes, he's, we agree with him. He, he led the nonviolent movement. He was thought of as a, as a radical. He was thought of as someone who was revolutionary and obviously lost his life to violence. The last thing I'll say is that what we're not talking about as well is that racism doesn't just hurt black people, right? It hurts white people too. And so while many of the, most of the people who are being killed by police violence are black and brown, lots of white folks are losing their lives. Lots of people who have mental health disability are losing their lives. And guess who's dying most of all who we're really not talking about? We're not talking about the fact that police officers are using their own weapons to kill themselves and commit suicide at incredibly high levels. And so let's not continue to think about this problem as a problem of the black and brown community. Let's start to think about this problem of violence, of harm, and the perpetuation of those ideas as a community problem, one that we're all responsible for solving together, and that if we could just really understand our interconnectedness, as Martin Luther King spoke about, and, and start to get proximate with some of these issues, as Brian Stevenson tells us, that we'd have a lot better shot 
at changing the future for ourselves and our children. Mitch, I'd like to welcome you back in to give us our closing remarks. Thank you so much. Alana, thank you so much for moderating this panel. And Nicole and Alex, thank you for what I, I thought was a fantastic conversation. It was brilliant. It was provocative. It was imaginative. It was compelling. Uh, Alec, you might, you might have felt radical. I didn't think that anything that you guys said was radical today. I think that you were appropriately tough um, as you should be on the problems. That's what the United States of America requires us to be. I'm always compelled to think about in this moment of um, President Trump, where he calls uh, American, sitters, uh, American uh, citizens traitors uh, for doing what? For protesting, for exercising their constitutional rights. Uh, in the First Amendment, the entire point of it uh, was to make sure that in order to preserve our democracy, we could redress our grievances against the government because the founding fathers knew that's how we perfected our democracy and they knew that it was imperfect. Um, you guys, I thought, did a spectacular job. And I, I, I so thank you for being with us today. Um, you know, one of the questions, Alec, that you raised was how, how do we encourage or prepare the people of America to hear, to know, to see, to understand, and, and now to act on uh, what, what is becoming so abundantly clear, which we could have and should have seen a long time ago. So I look forward to working with all of you and appreciate your insights and knowledge. Uh, and we look forward to having everyone next Thursday for our conversations on health equity. See you then. God bless you all. Thank you so much for being with us today.